Welcome to STEMiverse Podcast Episode 38. In this episode, Peter and Marcus talk with Seven Vinton. Seven is a co-inventor of the ARD2 Innovate Shield for the Arduino. He has dedicated the past six years to providing support for students and teachers with digital technologies and creating solutions which make coding easier for students. He presents annually at the Data Victoria and DLTV conferences, has co-authored the Digital Technologies Textbook for Nelson C. Engage, and is currently designing work units for the New Geelong Technical School. In this episode, Seven, who is a victim of mechanical typewriters from the previous century, talks STEM curricula and their attributes, increasing literacy performance, using data analysis tools to help with planning in the school environment, best use cases for end-of-year reports, educating parents, writing a STEM book for a large publisher, being a YouTuber, and much more. This is STEMiverse Podcast Episode 38. STEMiverse is a podcast produced by Tech Explorations. Our mission is to help educators become awesome at teaching STEM, be it at home or in the classroom. Whether you are a professional or casual teacher teaching in a classroom, or a parent or caretaker teaching at home, this podcast brings you the knowledge and experiences of practitioners, academics, entrepreneurs, and lifelong learners who are passionate about education and strive every day to help our children prepare for a life in a world of radical change, and why not, abundance. This podcast is brought to you by Tech Explorations, a leading provider of educational resources for makers, STEM students, and teachers. For a limited time only, go to texplore.com slash STEMiverse and receive Peter's latest ebook, Maker Education Revolution, a book about how making is changing the way that people learn and teach in the 21st century. Marcus. Back in the lab. You came a bit early this morning. Yeah, it was uh, half an hour too early, but uh, it's got to be too early than too late. I yeah, sure. Well, sometimes you lose time, uh, especially on what is the Thursday. Yeah, so we can, it's a bit of a different time, uh, start time for us than usual. And you had a, a rough couple of weeks. Oh, just, uh, yeah, keeping really, really busy. So today we've got a great guest, which is Seven, who yeah. I first discovered on the YouTube yeah. and then ran into at a conference. And so why don't we say hello to Seven? Yes. Hey, Seven. Hey, good morning. Good morning, Marcus and Peter. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us. And we know that you are at school right now. Uh, yes. So what is happening uh, right now at, at your location? Can you describe the setting? Well, I'm in my classroom at the moment, and I'm actually sitting on the floor because it's a lot more comfortable and because we're not doing video, <laughs> that's okay. Um, so I'm in the classroom that I normally teach in, but there are obviously no students here. So all the students today are at the athletic stay, and I will be making my way over there uh, after this session. What's happening in the athletic stay? You've got like track and field, sports. Yeah, uh, track and field. So in the first term of every year, we do our uh, track and field events. And then the students mm. that qualify in that event go off to um, regional and then state and then um, national competitions. And then it's the Olympics, right? Well, hopefully, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I remember those days. I always great fun. Like I look forward to being athletics instead of in the classroom. <laughs> I've got to ask you about your name. Um, the only other seven that I know is Seven of Nine, which is a uh, st- uh, reference Trek. to Star Trek. Yeah. Uh, have you have you, you seen the um, have you seen the Seinfeld episode about the the name Seven? No, no, no okay. I have not. That's one to watch. Quite a funny episode. Um, okay. George Costanza wants to name his child Seven, but somebody else goes to take the name. So he does everything he can to stop them from using his name. <laughs> so I, awesome. I often get um, that one reference to me. But the the name itself, it was actually um, my birth name that my parents gave me was um, uh, Stephen. Okay. But I was born in the days when they um, actually hand, so the type, typewriters would type out your um birth certificate oh. and so there must have been a, a key stuck and and um on my birth certificate that i got it came out without the t and so then um when i saw that 
when I think I was about the age of 10 or 11, I uh, thought, well, this was meant to be. So I decided to um, take the name Seven, but my um, parents weren't mm. very happy with it. So, yeah, it's been a bit of a bone of a contention with my parents, but, yeah, that, that's the story. <laughs> That is fantastic. Uh, it's a very interesting name, but it's very easy to find you on Google as well because I think you're the only one by that name. Yeah, well, that's true. So yeah, that's there's not that many bonus. around. And my surname is, is quite uncommon too. Yeah. It's a good name space. Great. <laughs> <very good. laughs> I hope you've got the domain and uh, locked up. <laughs> so listeners probably have grokked from the fact that you're in a classroom, that you're a teacher, yep. but what type of teacher are you and what do you teach? And what, I guess, level do you teach? Yeah, I've got a pretty broad range of subjects. I'm trained in arts and technology. So this year I've got a, a VCE class for, it's a, actually a combined class of 11s and 12s for art. Mm-hmm. And I've got a combined uh, 11 and 12 systems engineering. And then I've got a, a, a 7, 8 and 10 digital technologies so our, our school at the moment is going through a bit of a transition. It was uh, peaked in about 2013, I think. Um, we had, oh, sorry, not 2013, about 2010. We had about uh, 1,400 students. But a high school opened up in, um, in Torquay, and that was not one of our main feeders. So our numbers dropped a fair bit from there. And we're, geographically, we're located between two large secondary schools. So uh, our funding was um, not very uh, high in comparison to those other schools. So we've been battling with that for a while. We've made the decision to um, go for a move to one of the new areas that's opening up. There's an area called Armstrong Creek, new development area. And the um, the state government has supported that. So we're looking at um, moving the entire school over to um, that area and starting starting anew in that position. So that should boost our numbers back up again. Okay. So for our, we've got international listeners and uh, national listeners who aren't familiar with the local geography, yeah. where are you based and uh, what's the school? So the school is Oberon High School and it's in an, a um, suburb of Geelong called Belmont. And Geelong is in? So Geelong's just uh, about 100 kilometres south of Melbourne and mm-hmm. it's, I, think it's, I think it's the second biggest city in, in Victoria, I think. I'm not sure about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was um, a, a competition uh, city for the capital at one stage of Victoria. Yeah, so in our area, I'm not sure what the um, population of Geelong is now, but um, it's a quickly developing area. So we're looking, the area that we're moving to, that's in rapid development at the moment. Um, so there's, there's going to be a rapid population growth. So our numbers at the moment uh, have dropped down to about 560 at the moment, but we're looking at that coming back up to at least 1,200 by the time we get settled out at Armstrong Creek. So they're literally moving the school? Yeah, uh, yeah. So new buildings and um, moving all the staff. So it's not a closure, it's going Mm -hmm. to be a relocation. And apparently that happens very, very rarely. And the the only reason... I was about to say. Yeah, the only reason they're behind that is that um, our our results are are very good. Our VC results are excellent and our uh, NAPLAN results are excellent as well. Well, Glad you uh, brought that up. So then, because yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I was yeah. looking at the news last night. The news and, last uh, night, yeah. Yeah, and this morning as well, newspapers, Australian students go backwards in math, reading and science. Uh, in your particular case, your school, I understand that things are looking very good in that regard. But can you comment? Yeah, on that? Well, well, we focus on um, the growth. So what we do, so we, we, um, we concentrate on the growth between uh, year seven and year nine, and we try to ensure that we add value. So that we we want to see a um, a uh, movement upwards from year seven to nine, so we can ensure growth, and we want to do that across each of the areas. So we know we do that for uh, reading. We, we've uh, made big gains in writing. So writing, uh, a lot of the state is going backwards in their writing, but ours is um, ours is showing growth from seven to nine, and that is a, um, a very conscious effort. We um, have a whole school approach to writing, 
through all of our um, learning areas. Okay. Uh, and we do a, a fair bit of professional development on, on that. Uh, we're very in, ch- in tune with the uh, research from Professor Hattie. And, um, mm-hmm. yeah, we've, we've got some strategies in place to, um, to bring about those changes. And most of the time we're working on, um, you know, the, the imp- impacts, the effects of, of what matters most in the classroom. And we try to develop good teacher habits around those um, higher level effects. So how, how do you implement that? Because you're not, I guess, traditionally in a, uh, I guess, as long as if you're part of the English faculty or the history faculty. Well, one of my other roles is um, curriculum. So I, I was um, professional learning leader for the past four years. And now I'm curriculum leader. So I have a pretty um, um, significant leadership role in the school. And a lot, well, part of my job is to, um, to work on policy change with my leadership team and to develop strategies around that. So, yeah, what I do directly impacts just about every, well, every teacher in the school. Uh, what are the obstacles or problems that you see are across you know, the education sector that could cause or that could bring along results such as those that I mentioned earlier about, you know, dropping in performance across uh, the STEM board in a country that is as rich as Australia and forward-looking as Australia, I might say as well. Like I'd expect the opposite to be happening, definitely not a drop in performance. Are we losing or lowering our guard perhaps? Are we refocusing somewhere else away from the basics? What's happening based on what you see? Um, like I think there's a danger in, um, it, what do they say, um, weighing the pig more than you're feeding the pig. Hmm. So, to, you know, focus on too much assessment. I, I don't think we do that now. I think the, the NAP plan is a good indicator. Like if you look at countries like the States, so they probably headed down that, that road. Is that they've got, they seem to have a lot more problems than we do in that, that regard. Hmm. But, I mean, the NAP plan's a good indicator, but it's only one indicator. So I think you don't want to focus too much on, like, it's a one snapshot and, and you mm-hmm. have to collect all of all of the data, and that's what we try to do. Um, we, we use um, data analysis tools where we're feeding in a whole range of other uh, testing data, so on-demand data, you know, other tests that we um, have internally as well. We try to look at the whole picture mm-hmm. and just teacher observations too. There was a kind of a shift away from, you know, teacher observation at one point, but good teachers know their students and how they learn by observing. So you don't want to take that power away from the teacher either. It's a, um, a quality that teachers develop. Yeah. So, so I understand the news that we hear about performance-related issues just tell us one side of the story, and in particular, in the case of Australia, there is the NAPLAN results, which is, uh, I believe, a, a yearly test that most students in Australia take part in. So a bunch of numbers come out of that, they compile the numbers and they come up with some competitive data. Now, I would think better than last year, worse than last year, but obviously, as you're saying, it's not the only thing that matters. There's a lot that goes into building capabilities in a student and uh, the role of the student teacher to know the student is one of them. So you mentioned some data analysis tools. What do you use for that? Um, we're currently using um, uh, Accelerus. We, we use that for our reporting system and they've got a data analysis tool that you can input all of that data into and then you get to see data graphed. And one of the really good things mm-hmm. with that is you can see growth graphs. So you can pick pick two points, like a, say a um, semester one to sem- semester one over it, you know, a one one year period or two year period, and you can get to see how how those students are tracking, and that'll um, show that information as the students as individual bands um, either moving up or moving down, and so you can pick out an individual student. So you see um, a student that was in the the high band and then has dropped down. And so you can pick that up and, and then ask, start asking the questions, well, why did that student drop down or, or why are these students um, flatlining uh, and how did these students at the lower end make these you know, big gains over this year? So you can really start to drill down into that data. And one of the things that we, we see uh, and, and one of our fo- uh, foci is 
on the top end students, that's challenging those top end students to make sure that they are not um, just idling, that they are being challenged mm-hmm. uh, because that's one of the dangers when you've got multiple levels in the classroom, you tend to hit the middle group and um, the lower lower group because they're, they're, I guess, more obvious, but your higher end students can, because they, they get through the work, um, you, you can tend to just, you know, let them kind of idle. So we've got a real push on challenging the top end. And you can really see looking at this, um, this data on the, on the graph that some of these students are just flatlining. So they're not, not making any gains. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So I got two questions out of that. The first is, is Accelerus, is that quite a common piece of software? Is that yeah, yeah. something that you'd find across the it it's, um, it's, I think it's one of the most popular in Australia. I, th- I think they're international too. Uh, I'm not 100% sure of that, but I, I think they are. Um, really easy to use package. So for um, report, write, um, the report writing process, that that has been a, um, a real plus for us because it's just so versatile. So we can have our, our teachers writing reports to basically the day they go out, uh, which is pretty handy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, awesome. And are you feeding your teacher observations into that or is that a different system as well? Uh, well, I guess the teacher observation would become coming as part of the report writing process. So our reports are uh, largely uh, scriptive. Okay. So they're more like um, subjective observations of how students doing yeah, you know, so results of a test. Like what that. I'm trying to tease out Seven is uh, any of the tips and tricks that uh, he might be or his school might be doing in uh, maybe better using that package versus, I guess, other schools because you know, you're talking about how you're targeting growth. To and quantify, and, your, quantify your students. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, this is a dilemma that I face quite every year is that you know, traditionally we have this end of year report and, you know, change happens very slowly in, in schools. And um, um, Peter, you pointed this out quite clearly in your um, your book that, you know, it's, the education hasn't really changed much in, you know, at least the last 100 years. So when you want to make changes, so you have to be quite patient. So we've still got the kind of traditional um, method of uh, a, an interim report at, at the term so for term one, term three, and then a larger report in um, uh, at the end of term t- two and end of term four. And um, every time we do that large report, I think, well, how, what what difference is this going to make? You know, especially the one that comes at the end of the year because you've got that six-week break. Is that going to make any difference at all? And because it's like summative assessment, it probably won't make that difference. Um, so part of the plan is to try and, Build in a little bit more of the um, formative assessment across across the year. Uh, we also use a tool called um, Zuno, which is a uh, we use as our parent portal. It means that we can contact the parents at any time we want and to do sort of more informal reporting. And th- there was talk about going to um, uh, ongoing reporting systems and. I don't know if you've talked to anybody about ongoing reporting, but some some love no, it, some love it, some hate it. But I came to the realization that we do we have ongoing reporting anytime we want, and it's um, very flexible. If you want to send a report to a parent, you just send them a message on this um, this portal, and they get it. That's that's a report. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's really just about. I mean, reporting is just feedback. So. Um, a feedback system that that works uh, and is is flexible, easy to use. Well, that's ongoing reporting, as far as I'm concerned. So, part of my plan this year is to um, push that a little bit more and encourage our staff to to do more informal reporting to parents across the year. Correct. So we we hear a lot about teachers being, I guess, overworked. So not only are they having to feed the pig, but they're now having to do all the yep. bureaucracy side of things outside of that. How would you, uh, what recommendations would you give to teachers who want to be able to do this continuous reporting and uh, how to do deficient? Really, uh, essentially doing data analysis in a way that sounds like, I guess, a traditional teacher wouldn't have done in the past. Well, see, the thing is, it can 
work in your favour. And and those that do it know know this. And like I'll give an example. Um, I haven't taught Year Sevens for a while, and I'm teaching Year Sevens for the first time in about uh, five years. So I've got them for digital technologies. And uh, one of my first classes for this year, there was a student in the class that was very distracted, just completely un- unfocused and was getting into, it had a bad habit of not engaging in, in the learning and just um, then, you know, causing a little bit of um, disruption in the classroom. But when we did our first session with um, the uh, Arduinos, this student really, you know, picked up and I saw that, they had a um, a bit of a um, a nouse for the technology, the, the programming. So the, one of the things I did was that as soon as that class finished, I just got onto um, our um, parent portal and, and sent a, a message to his parents saying, you know, how how uh, pleased I was that he um, made the effort and that he, you know, he he, he um, by putting that effort in, I think he's he's got a a good potential to do really well in the subject. And then the next day, what I noticed is that he was sitting down the back of the class. I noticed he he moved up to the front. He moved up to the front chair and he's been um, great ever since. And um, that wasn't an isolated case. So uh, once again, did it with another student in the class, exactly the same thing happened. So when you're giving that positive encouragement and that goes to the parents and if the parents pick up on it, it, it makes a big difference. So just by investing that little bit of a time, like that message might have taken me five minutes, but in the classroom, that, that saves me. If you think about you know, across the term or across the semester or across the year, that little bit of investment in time can save you a lot of time. So if you, if you think about it like that, it's uh, it's a good investment. Is that one of your examples also of a one of your top band students just flatlining and you're able to see that from the data? In terms of um, uh, identifying students, you mean? Yeah, so um, you said previously that uh, it was not engaged. you were able to see the different bands of your students through the data and then identify perhaps these are the top and students that need further engagement yeah. uh, simply from the data. The unfortunate thing for me in my area is um, we don't have any like uh, quantitative data that we can uh, use in that way, like in the arts and technology at the moment. Mm-hmm. Like our data is mainly for our numeracy literacy. So for me personally, uh, I can see the numeracy literacy data and I can look at that and I can then say, well, maybe these students are, uh, you know, not engaging. Um, but it, within my classroom, particularly in my year 10 group, I've got a, a really big a range from the, the lower end students to the higher end students. And looking at their NAPLAN data, I could see that they were flatlining. Uh, so I've got a group that I've um, identified in that class that I've got working together. And so I constantly push them and challenge them all the time. So mm-hmm. I know that that group is quite engaged in my my classroom. So the thing is that what I would then do is go and observe what's going on in the other classrooms. Uh, and we've got a system set up. We, we do um, one, every term we do classroom visits where we can um, go into other teachers' classroom by invitation and just observe our students in different settings and give feedback to the teacher as well. So it's like a coaching, mentoring, you know, reciprocal role that we do for each other. Yeah, so it's, it's good to observe the students in other classrooms just to see how, um, you know, what the differences are and how they're in, engaging and responding. So the, I suppose one of the values of the feedback, the way you do it is that it's time sensitive. So you see something good that the particular student did and you report it or you record it and report it to the person's parents quite quickly. And I think that timeliness is also a benefit, right? Instead yeah. of waiting for the end of the term to say that he did well. Yeah, definitely. And when you've got when you've got parents on board, it makes such a difference. And I mean it's not always the case. Sometimes the parents um, you know, don't come on board. And I, I think it's more to do with experiences that they might have had when they went to school as well. Like we've got to take that in consideration too. School's not a great place for some people. So that sometimes it has bad memories. So, yeah. you, you know, when you're dealing with parents, you just have to be aware of what the backgrounds are, what the, what the history is and um, what their attitudes to school were and then just try to bring the conversation around, look, we're all on the same team here and we want to do the best for your child. 
you know, there's another challenge, isn't it? And, uh, yeah. It takes, uh, takes a bit of effort to help the students and the parents help the chief students. It goes back. So jumping onto a different track now. Yeah. When I first came across you, I found you on YouTube of all places. Yeah. So my first question is, why were you not Australian of the Year this year? <laughs> um, well, I guess there's... The song was next year. Quite a... <laughs> maybe, maybe next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's a reference to Eddie Wu, who uh, got Australia of the Year for his... Uh, who will be on this podcast soon. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> it's it's, inter- <laughs> it's interesting that, <laughs> that side of things. And um, Peter, you would find this too, that I guess what we do, because... Now, I, I know from, because I, I took uh, your, you, you've got the course on uh, Udemy with the um, Arduino. Yeah. I think you've also got the um, the Raspberry Pi one, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Got a Raspberry Pi, Arduino's, uh, Kaiker, a couple of other courses. So I think I've, I've taken um, both of those. But what you and I do, we're not into the gimmick. We're not into the, yes. you know, the wow, <laughs> wow factor. It's just a bare, bare bones, and that doesn't grab people very quickly. So it's a slow migration across, uh, and that's what I found. And you know, when you go to these conferences and things, you you see, you know, the the big wow things happening. Mm. Uh, one of the things that always sticks in my mind is the um, now robots, and you see them um, dancing and talking and what have you, and they draw a crowd around. And what what I I do is is um it doesn't have the wow but I think it has a lot more deeper application some really deep learning yeah. yeah but you just don't have the bells and whistles as much so the migration is slow so so the YouTube channel um yeah it was you know it's only got I think seven hundred subscribers and uh, I don't know how many views it's got now but it it was very very slow going uh, I haven't actually put any new material on for a while because I've just been engaged in other things, but it will be something that I get back to. And just with me personally, like my personal life is I've got a pretty big family. I've got now five children and my youngest is wow. two. Whoa. Um, <laughs> wow. And, How is that? Yeah, look, so <laughs> and now I've got them spread over <laughs> quite a bit of time. So my oldest is yeah. uh, twenty. 26 this year, I think. Yeah, 26 this year. And so my youngest is two. Uh, so quite a big gap. And my two year old, just over the last um, year, I think she was having one tooth every fortnight. Oh. So I didn't. <laughs> Great sleeping. Yeah, I didn't sleep for <laughs> at least six months. So that, that had a pretty oh, big. Dear pretty big impact on it me. It does hurt productivity. And she, de- she demands a lot of time. So if I want to get any work done, I um, I have to be uh, here at work. I don't get much done at, at it's home. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I always say that things like no, YouTube really. and in general work, like the kind of work that we do uh, is not a sprint. And um, when you have to choose, sometimes you don't have to choose. Some people are just gifted naturally. I think, um, was it David, David Wood? David? The um, the student of the year, Eddie, Eddie, was. Eddie, yeah, I'd be wrong. Eddie, I, I see Eddie like he's amazing, as natural, engaging kind of person. And uh, it's, I think, uh, there is a lot of substance there as well, but he's unique and I mm. totally recognize that. But I think for somebody like myself or you, seven is um, just a long term, steady pace, steady pace, uh, it's produced quality material and I think yep. that's our style. We're, we're, the, we're the tortoise, not the hare. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, so tortoises, you guys were talking about uh, this thing called Arduino. What's that? Uh, so um, now Peter knows this better than I do. He's been doing it a lot longer than me. But um, Arduino is a, um, well, it's a, a family of microcontrollers. So you've got a whole lot of different varieties in there. Uh, the most common being the Arduino Uno. And essentially it's just a little computer that allows you to um, interact with the real world. So you've got the ability to put inputs and outputs. And I, I tell my students that when we first start using it, I say, well, you know, this computer, this is, this is a computer, but it's a, you know, it's about a thousand times slower than, you know, your laptop. But um, and I asked them who um, Neil Armstrong is, and of course they tell me that he was the first person to walk on the moon. 
And I said, well, this, this um, little computer here is uh, more powerful than the one he used to um, track his journey to the moon and back. So, yeah, yeah like yeah. it's, <laughs> it's um, a fairly simple device, but it's um, you can certainly use it to do some pretty amazing things. And it's a great educational tool as well in so many aspects. Yeah. Um, like uh, if you enumerate some of the things that you can learn around the Arduino or using the Arduino, what would you say? Um, I started off um, my journey with um, Raspberry Pi. Uh, that was about uh, six or so years ago, maybe seven years ago now, losing track of time here. But that was the second time that I was interested in electronics. So I'll go back to the, my childhood in a minute because it's quite similar to um, to yours, Peter, from reading your book. Mm-hmm. So I started off with the Raspberry Pi and, and started teaching that and then I discovered the, um, the Arduino. And, you know, this is the really interesting thing. When, like people just think that, you know, we've got these people, who, you know, like, like me or yourself and we went to uni and we learnt this stuff at uni and, you know, well, it's easy for you because you've done these courses. Well, no, it didn't, it didn't happen like that at all. When I first, yeah. I, I got my Arduino in, in the mail, I, I ordered it online and then when it arrived, I'm like looking at it like, well, all right, but how did this thing work? And I didn't have a clue how to make it work. And so I had to teach myself. And, you know, you point out in, in your book, Peter, that in, in the, um, the days that we grew up, there were, were no um, online uh, resources. We didn't, we didn't have the internet. Yeah. We didn't have access to all this information. We didn't have YouTube, things like that. But now there's, there's really no excuse to, to learn. If you want to learn something, then it's there. It's easy for you to learn. And especially for, and this is the reason why I switched across to Arduino, there's so much information out there. It's, it's over, overwhelming really. And that's the thing. You just, it's getting over that fear factor of, um, you know, n- not knowing and just having a go and then making mistakes and learning. Is that what you're passing to your students as well, like to start depending on? Definitely, and sometimes I, I make it harder. You know, like you know, you hear the, the thing about well, it's okay to fail, and we, we get that coming through. You know, all our schools, it's okay to fail. Um, that's part of learning. But you you know what? Do we actually give our students the opportunity to fail? Hmm. Because sometimes I don't believe we do. <laughs> sometimes we make it just too easy for them. We give them the answers. I think some some teachers are f- afraid of um, of empty space. You know, they don't want to disappoint. Mm-hmm. So yeah, because they they feel the pressure on them to deliver all the time. John Hattie said um, that you know students now know they've gotten to the habit. They know that all they have to do is come to school and watch the teacher work, and that's that's <laughs> true. Like we do all the work and we provide all the answers, and and you see the students they sit there and they wait for the answers. Mm. Do you see the Arduino and similar technologies because there's so many out there as a way to expose students to those kinds of problems where they actually have to, you know, a problem may be unique to them and they have to sit down and yeah, definitely. like their so-called grid until they solve it. Yeah, and this is, this is why these um, devices like the Arduino are so good because there's so many possibilities. Like the, the more simpler the thing is, the more possibilities, and and this is where your creativity comes into it too. And I, I call these um, open box technologies. Mm. It's completely open. There's no no hidden parts. It's all it's all labelled. You can see, you know, everything that's there, and yet it doesn't do anything without you taking the steps to make it do something. Um, so it's different than like we we were using um, Lego. You know the Lego Mindstorms and, and things like that. Now the Lego, that's fantastic for schools. But the thing that was disappointing to me was that um, you know the the brains of the thing, the control box, it's closed technology. Mm. And I thought, you know, if you want to hack that, you, you can program it, but it's got these limitations on it. So the actual um, mechanical side of it is fantastic because it's just bits and pieces and i think um you put in the um quote uh, where's that one um about the creating from a pile of junk somewhere in the book yeah 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 you know so you you've got a pile of junk and to make something of it you you have to use your creativity 
so if you've got a pile of Lego, then you have to employ your creativity to, to make something of it. No, no instructions. No, no instructions. And the Arduino device, it's like, all right, we've got this thing here, but it doesn't, doesn't really do anything. It's just a very simple thing. But then if you, if you ignite that curiosity, so you use a hook, uh, and there's so many great hooks online with all the projects that people have done. So that's what I show my students. Like these are the possibilities. This is what other people are doing out there. And these are people that are your age doing this as well. Mm, yeah, for example. Yeah. And then they come back and say, well, I've got this idea. I really want to do this. Now, this is where some teachers get a little bit scared. It's like, I don't know how to do this. So therefore, maybe not. Maybe we won't do that. My approach is, all right, if I think, yeah, there's a possibility there, I don't have a clue how to do that. But you know what? Let's <laughs> That's just, a word I use all the time. Yeah, let's <laughs> just learn how to use it together because I can guarantee you somebody out there has attempted that and they might have just done it. So it's all about um, researching, um, being a good learner. It's just being a good learner. And how do I go about solving this problem? So there's some there's some aspects of Arduino that teachers might find daunting. Yeah, but I, I do understand that you've created or co-invented something that can help with this. Yeah, yeah. well, um, working with one of my students, I I've, I ran um, a code club, code and robotics club at lunchtime that I I still run. I don't get a lot of students coming along because we're we're a pretty sporty school, so at lunchtimes the kids tend to play a lot of sport. But I get the kids that in that don't you know, like the sport. So it's good good for that. So we had a situation where, you know, the kids could just drop in, learn how to code, uh, work with some robot robots and things like that. And one of the students that came in, he was really keen to do some programming. So I started him, him off with um, Python and then introduced him to Arduino. And he just had a natural curiosity for um, digital technologies. He, he, do you know who um, Farnsworth is? Yep. Uh, the guy who invented the TV. Mm-hmm. So just like him, this, this um, boy, this is, this is Mark Tresice, who is one of the co-authors in, on um, and the co-inventor of the, um, the Innovate Shield. He lives on a farm and he would just pull things apart and then, you know, experiment with them, just like Farnsworth did. So I just encouraged him doing that and, you know, we formed a pretty good um, working relationship. And he would come along uh, with me to the, you know, the events like the Data Vic um, seminars and things like that and, and help me out. And he, and he was a great help with that too because, you know, he got to a point where he was new almost as much as I did. And when you're in those sessions and you've got about 20, 25 teachers and teachers are surprisingly more difficult to teach than students, but... Um, it's really great to have a helping hand. So yeah, we we went we were doing those sessions, and so using uh, breadboards um, just to do some simple um, Arduino um, sketches. And what we realised is that we spent more time teaching people how to put the you know the components in than we did on the code. So we didn't get onto the code quick enough. So we saw there were a few, um, you know, different things on the market. So um, the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences had a shield. There's this, now Marcus, you would know the name of that one. Um, Thinker Shield. Thinker Shield, yep. Thinker Shield, yeah. So I, I got a, a whole lot of those in and started using those, but they they were limited for what we particularly wanted to do. So Mark and I had a chat and we went and paid a visit to um, Richard Wilson at Wiltronics in in Ballarat. Mm-hmm. Now, he's been one of the um, longest-term suppliers of um, educational um, electronics and science equipment. And so we sat down with him in a meeting just before Christmas a couple of years ago and uh, talked about, you know, what we would like to see. And he just said, well, how about we just make our own? So he said, you, you design it and we'll, we'll get it made. Can you describe that process? The, the process of the, the making and designing? So as a teacher, for example, yeah. I think actually it's a good question. Wow, good job. <laughs> just kidding. So I'm just thinking Thanks, of Phil. other teachers uh, in your shoes who, you know, they've got a class in some STEM discipline. It might be about the Arduino, it might be about Raspberry Pi or something else. And they say, hey, we should 
improve this aspect of teaching. In your case, it was let's not spend so much time wiring, spend much more time in programming. And then you took that idea and converted it into an invention. So I think that's what you're asking, Marcus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Tell the process of like narrowing down the requirements so then you can go to manufacture and have that shield in your case made. Yeah, well, I mean, there's so many up opportunities these days because you've just got to tap into what that um you know that's what invention is it's um solving a problem and and solving there's a need there and and that's what we did in this particular case is just to overcome those um those obstacles and like from a teacher point of view one of the the biggest headaches for me was at the end of the class just making sure the kits were put back together properly because you've got all these, like you've got loose resistors, diodes, oh, capacity, you've got yeah. all those things. And, of course, the kids aren't going to put them back properly. So I don't have the luxury of having a, a teacher aide to help me, so I have to do that myself. But with these devices, they're all on board. So you don't, you have to worry about, you know, putting the pieces back together. Mm. I know that at the start of the class I can just grab the kids and they'll be ready to go, and that saves me a lot of time. And just in terms of um, getting into the coding quickly, the students just grab a kit, plug it in, and I, I will give them a, a challenge to do, and they're, they're into the code straight away. So it saves yeah. a, real, a lot of time, and we're getting, through, we're getting through the material much faster. And then what we do, if we want to, if we don't want to actually go back to the um, circuitry, then we just take the shields off and we do it with, um, you know, just the Arduino and, and use a breadboard. So your options are completely open with that. Uh, and one of the things that, um, and you, you would know this, Peter, with um, you, say you're wanting to run, uh, say, four, four, three or four servos at one time mm -hmm. and, you know, you have to use a external breadboard and an external power supply. Because that um, drive off, yeah. Though. Because your USB port on your computer won't handle that much um, current. Uh, so yep. what we did on the board was on one side we've got the ability to plug your servo motors straight in to the um, the sockets on the side, and then we've got a a, um, a terminal you can you can plug in a, a six volt battery, and you can you can run it off the external voltage for the servo. So yeah, it's pretty handy for that too. Yeah, so we tried to um, just, you know, have think of all the things that we do in the classroom, all the basic code le lessons and put them onto that board. So you can do things like um, data uh, logging. You can set up a, you know, banana keyboard like um, the Makey Makey. Yeah, so you can integrate yeah. other tech with it. Yeah, the Makey Makey uses um, uh, capacitance to... Um, to allow that process, but um, what we did is we just put one meg resistors. Um, so we just yeah they, they've got a um, you know the voltage divider, so you can do like a pull up, so pull down with resistor on each of those, so that yeah it works quite well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now you use uh, your own invention in your classes, right? Yeah, yeah, and it saved me awesome. a lot of time. Saved the time. <laughs> yeah. So now I'd like to jump into a slightly different topic because sure. I'm mindful of our time as well, and I really want to ask you about this. It was actually my first question here, but somehow, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in your capacity as a curriculum leader, you obviously create curriculums. Um, I wanted to ask you about your opinion is what the purpose of a curriculum, not just in STEM, but in general should be. So when somebody says, I want to make a curriculum in geography or in conservation or in STEM, for example, what are your guidelines? What are you trying to achieve with a curriculum? Um, well, yeah, I mean, there's a few things. Like, obviously, we, we look at the um, Victorian curriculum standards. And so what we would do is, encourage teachers to develop a scope and sequence document that looks at the learning over, you know, the whole course of learning from year seven to, to year 10 and then how that inputs into uh, the VCE. So the Victorian curriculum you mean, so that's, that's something that you really need to integrate with whatever you produce in order to be compliant. So that's one aspect. Yep, so that's, aspect. that's um, the one aspect of it. What we tend to do here is look at um, skills beyond year 12. 
And in particular, I do this because I'm very mindful of students going into engineering or, you know, computer programming, things like that. So I, I will start with those skills and try to bring them down and then fit that in with the Victorian curriculum. But having a scope and sequence document, so you're looking at that whole, whole range of learning is really helpful to see how what you do at the lower end can impact on the, um, the, the upper end. And then once you've got that, you can start to plug things in. So, you know, you can start to look at your vocabulary use. So you're building that, um, you know, that language for the, the senior years because we know that students in um, the VCE, if they have that vocabulary developed, around their, especially around their subject area, they're more articulate and their, their marks are going to be higher in, you know, in uh, the, you know, their year 12 uh, for the VCE. And that, and that helps improve thinking too because if you've, got, you, you've got more extensive vocabulary. Um, you can short circuit some, some of your sentences and your, your sentences become more, um, you know, packed with uh, information. So, so that's one of our pushes too, to increase the vocabulary at the lower end, we, we, we looked into the, the research of Mazzano for that uh, to try and build in some strategy, strategies for that. So who is Mazzano, if I got that right? Yeah, Mazzano is uh, right. seven steps of um, uh, vocabulary. Okay, got it, thanks. We're quite big on, and I noted this in your book too, Peter, with um, Carol Dweck and the, the mindsets. Yep. So we, we bring that in into our curriculum um, planning as well and how we can encourage, you know, different ways of thinking and our opening of mindsets. Our whole classroom structure is um, set around this too. So we, we often uh, will start the, you know, learning intentions and very clear learning intentions is, is a big part of our everyday learning. So just to clarify to the students what, what the purpose of the, the lesson is, um, what they should be getting out of it, just so they're clear what what the focus is. Mm-hmm. Using hooks into the lesson to try and um, boost that natural curiosity and, and engagement, and um, ensuring uh, feedback mechanisms are in place too. So with our assessment, we try to target and be very strategic with our assessment, not to overly assess, but just to assess at the right times to ensure that students are getting feedback to encourage their growth and, and um, to help track whether they're within their zone of proximal development and then that they're being um, challenged. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty complex thing, but um, once you have that scope and sequence document, it's, that's the skeleton which, which you can build, build on and they're very much ongoing documents, a lot live documents that we go back and, mm-hmm. and tweak here and there. And digital technologies, like any of the classroom teachers you might have talked to, is that what's going on in primary school is constantly evolving. So what's happening in the secondary school is, is an also has to constantly evolve. This year I have gone from, we used to do um, the block code with our students. So using like Scratch and, um, and with uh, the Arduino, I, I used a program called uh, Snap for Arduino. Yep, yep. This year with my year sevens, I've made the decision to go straight to Arduino text-based code. Why was that? Well, because they've, they've done so much of it at primary school now. So you really have to... Really? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you really have to um, just have a discussion with your students and t- to know what they've done, what, what's their prior learning been. One of the biggest... Um, you know, engagement turnoffs is if they're doing the same thing again and again. Australian history. We know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who that uh, okay, awesome. Uh, I've just got to uh, be encouraged of the time. <laughs> I've got to ask you about the book you've written with David Grover. I've had a look at it and it's just amazing. So please tell us about it, what it is. Okay. And then we can give you more fanboy isn't it? Uh, oh, and before you start, Seven, I yeah. just wanted to comment about the book. So the title is Digital Technologies for the Australian Curriculum, right? So it sounds like a technical book, right? Yeah. And when I browse through it and I'm reading various contents, I, I find lots of code, of course, text-based code, but there's also content on things like ethical issues and mm. equality and 
privacy, there's nature and conservation. There are like there's a lot of things that I don't remember myself seeing in my textbooks. No, copy left. Of it. <laughs> copy <laughs> left. Of thing. Back when I was a student. So things have moved along. So mm. tell us about your book. Yeah, well, David's had a long experience in um in this area and in writing, uh, so very, very knowledgeable um, man. And now I came on to the scene with these books fairly late with the the first one was the Year 7 and 8 one. So David's written most of um, the books and I was mainly responsible for the um, Arduino chapters and um, in the second book I focused on so the Arduino and the SQL uh, and then I re- reviewed um all, all of David's work. The aim was to, first of all, uh, have project-based approach mm-hmm. and be as engaging in the, the practical side as much as possible. But then, as you say, like tying in um, the ethics around that too uh, because this doesn't happen in a um, vacuum. It's, it has impacts on real people. So there are real ethical issues uh, associated with with technology. But that's a, a characteristic of STEM as well, right? Technology doesn't happen in isolation, no. but you need to acknowledge the society in which all these activities are taking place. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, and as you say, that the title's fairly, um, it looks like a, a technical guide, but the way we wanted to write it too was in a, a way that uh, was a little bit more informal, I guess, and sort of a, more like it told a story. So, you know, so often the um, the chapters start off with a little bit of a story and then move into the, the learning. Mm-hmm. And what uh, Nelson Sengage wanted was a, a workbook that students could work, you know, with, with and work through problems and things like that. But what David and I realised is that, you know, the teachers don't have this knowledge. So if you're giving this textbook that doesn't have the content in it, doesn't have that that background knowledge, then the teachers the teachers might not have that. They might not be able to provide that to the students. So we tried to make it as much as possible that the, it would be as much as a teacher resource book as it was a, a student workbook. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, um, they're fairly thin books and um, both David and I could have put in twice as much content and we we had a really hard time with the editors and we had to cut back a lot of material so a lot of what we wrote didn't get put in and there was there was other stuff that would have been really good to put in like like I would have liked to have written some um you know javascript um uh, projects and things like that but we just had to pull it back uh because the editors had their their quotas, you yeah. know, prices that they had to, guidelines that they have to meet. and But you've got our website companion as well. We, I think you've got additional content there. Yeah, we've got a, a little bit of additional and uh, all the code and stuff is on the Nelson Sengage website. Yeah, and I guess in, in the future books we might better put a, a bit more. But, yeah, hopefully they're helpful. I think it's it's uh, filled a, a bit of a gap that was there. So help, hopefully that teachers are getting... Um, good value out of these and, and we're actually help making a difference in their classrooms. Do you plan to continue writing books? Um, yeah, yeah. It was it was certainly a difficult process. Um, you know, it was my first time, so just learning the ropes of that uh, and David was really helpful in mentoring me through that process. What was the Did, process like? Um, it was really good um, in terms of, you know, like a learning curve. Uh, and I love I love learning curves. I love it when I'm feeling stressed, and but when you reach the top of that learning curve, it's it's fantastic. So that that was great. Frustrating in terms of you know just having to cut back material and things like that. But hmm. yeah, I mean it, when it's all done, it's just good to see you know the books there. And you look through the books and you go, oh, I wish I could have put that in or this in or could have changed that. Yeah, of course. But that's just the way. Second the way edition. It is. Yeah. <laughs> I feel when it comes to books that it's a great opportunity to learn. So when you want to learn something, consider writing a book about it. Just the amount of research, yeah, of putting the hard thinking, the cleaning up, you know, the editing, oh, all yeah. that really is. Yeah, um, and I was I was a little cool. bit, um, you know, my, my approach is a bit more informal and 
David, because he's gone through this process so many times, he was the one that, you know, kept me on um, on the kind of straight and narrow in terms of making sure my T's were crossed and I's were dotted because, you know, the language had to be exact. And so that was that was good, learning learning all that, just making sure that I was doing the right thing. Hmm. You know, I, I was a chef before I was a teacher and I, I didn't measure things when I was cooking in kitchens. I just kind of took a pinch of that and a pinch of that and threw it in. But you you can't do that when you're, you, you know, producing books for schools. You have to be quite precise with your use of language and, you know, things like yeah. that. Yeah. It's so interesting that you say that. I actually used to cook like that, like a pinch of this and a pinch of that. And now I've got the scale out constantly. <laughs> and I'm to the ingredients. And, yeah, it's, when you're writing a, a technical book, so in my family uh, there's actually a couple of authors and I'm the only one that is a technical author, so I write the books about technology so yeah. the code has to be confirmed and executed i've got to account for different versions uh, i have to provide accurate instructions on how to put a circuit together where my father especially my father is a poet uh, he just gets uh, inspiration and but the approach is so different isn't it? The, the discipline mm. is uh, totally different and, and you know too when you're writing writing code as well um you know, you might have gone through five or six different versions and then your head starts to get into a bit of a spin and then when you put yeah. it into the book, you're constantly paranoid that you might have put the wrong thing in. Exactly. And, you know, and, and what you don't want to happen is to get it to print and then look through and go, oh, no, there's a mistake there. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you only do e-books. <laughs> I can update easily. Speaking of books, uh, what, what books would you recommend to our listeners? So then uh, let's say uh, they could be textbooks, so it could be more general nature, books about STEM or education, books that you have enjoyed reading. Um, well, see, most of my stuff comes from online, like it's more kind of hands-on practical stuff. Sure. Like your your your, your book um, on the maker revolution is is worth a read. Definitely, I I think if people can get their hands on that because uh, that that kind of sums up what this whole area of um, learning is about. So that that was a good read. You know, the, the where I got most of my learning was like Simon Monk with the Raspberry Pi, Adafruit, um, Spark Fun, the uh, in what's it called the invent inventable. Um, you know, the maker. Um, those online websites. Uh, Make a magazine. Yeah, oh, yeah, yes. Make a magazine. Uh, your course on Udemy, I would recommend people if they want to get right into the highly technical side. Um, I would recommend your your courses on there because that's just such a comprehensive collection. Like if I don't know how to do something, I'll, I'll use it as my resource guide mm. because it's just, you know, you know, you've got all your videos there as well too. So that's been really handy. I read things like, you know, the Hattie's material, Sir Ken Robinson material, um, Carol Dweck for, for the other, so for the educational side there, the types of um, material I, I read. James Anderson um, studied under Carol Dweck in the States for a while. Uh, and he does a lot of work in Australia. So he's kind of like um, Australia's Carol Dweck that goes around to school and and um, teaches about the, the mindset and how to, um, you know, build in uh, awareness of mindset into your learning. Uh, yeah, it's so important. Yeah, I read his material as well. So I kind of, I've got a fairly broad uh, readership, um, but there's just so much online. And And, you know, I will say this, though, that, with digital technologies, it's so easy to get overwhelmed because there's so much out there and there's a new thing every week, basically. But the advice I would give there is pick the thing that you find most comfortable with and just stick with that. And often when I go to like network meetings and that kind of thing, I hear people say, oh, we should be teaching our students, you know, Python coding or, or this or that. And I just say, no, no, no. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. What you want to do is pick what you're comfortable with and stick to it because if you teach mm -hmm. your students how to program in Python, the fundamentals of programming are there. 
it's so it's easy for them then to move across to you know C plus plus or exactly. anything else. You you don't want to restrict anyone. You just say do what you feel most comfortable with. So if it's an Arduino Uno that you feel comfortable with, with that is fine. And and you really yeah. don't have to do much else because it teaches the language of digital technologies. Uh, and you would know this, um, Peter, from your background in uh, electronics. You know, when you were young and you were, you know, fit, um, playing around with the electronics. Well, the the Arduino Uno could have been, you know, made then. Really, it would have been, you know, a bit bigger, a bit different, but more expensive. <laughs> more expensive, yeah. But the, no resources. You know, the same thing. Like you think about this. The, you know, your resistors, your transistors, your capacitors. They were pretty much exactly the same then as they were net or they are now and that that whole uh inventor you know uh movement that was Man, big in revolution yeah it was mm. big in the the 80s and it died off in the 90s if that had it kept going through we wouldn't have some of the issues that we have now because you know our, our um children would have still been doing those things now why that that happened i you know, I, I can't pinpoint, but I th- think it's got a fair bit to do with, um, you know, the development of um, computers and computer games. But Yeah, I've got a theory about that and how that was lost in the, like, the missing generation. Yeah. Um, my theory involves things such as the web. Uh, funny enough, mm-hmm. I just diverted people's creative attention into HTML and things like that. Some of them became consumers. Yeah. Also, Consumerism as well and things like that. Also but, the change in curricula. So back in the day, they used to be yeah. teaching how to use essentially like word processing apps word, and that yeah. was, you know, ICT and computing. Mm. Yeah. So. so there was also the perception that if you tinker with electronics, you're just wasting your time playing around with toys where, you know, you need to learn how to do Excel to get a job. Yeah. <laughs> so there was a lot of pressure as well. But the, the creativity was taken away. From that, yeah. and that's the that's the big thing that come out of this. Like I say to um, when other teachers when I go and do seminars and my own students that creativity is the difference between the next big thing and the same old thing. Mm. So that's that's what we need to um, ensure that we've we haven't taken the creativity out of out of these lessons. And anybody can be creative, right? So don't give all don't give all the answers away. Yeah. So a bit of stress helps. We need to include more stress, like stress not uh, raising your blood pressure and you know almost getting a heart attack because of the stress stressful questions that the mm-hmm. teacher is asking. Yeah. But you know, don't give all the answers. And uh, I often, with my students, you probably have seen some of my videos. I leave bugs that plague me so we're developing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I lecture. I just leave it in there. <laughs> Yeah, and I do I've got some of that in my letters course. Exactly the same thing. Uh, yeah, that that is a really good um, little trick to um, just yeah cause a little bit of stress and and um, you know problem solving. How do you yeah, get around the problem? Like don't swear much, so yeah. to, to yeah. cut things. As you say, let your failures be a lesson to everybody else. Yeah, exactly. I value my failures and uh, all my problems. Exactly. Yeah, it's just to learn. Brilliant. Well, we're running out of time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm seven. I've got to keep so going for another hour, probably, I think. Yeah, so, yeah. Absolutely. I think we could absolutely. Yeah. We'll have to get you on again. Yeah. So we'll just jump to the the wonderful rapid fire questions part right. of the podcast. Yeah. I'll fire it off with an easy one for you. What is your programming language of choice? Um, I love uh, C. And I started oh, cool. off with, yes. with um, C. I love C++. I mm-hmm. actually, believe it or not, I started with um, COBOL and Pascal when I was, uh, I think, 14. Yeah, 14. yeah. And the reason I got into COBOL and Pascal was I worked at a paper pulping factory when I was 13, 14. And in the paper pulping pile, there were two books. One was on Pascal and one was on COBOL. And I read them and taught myself how to program. The only thing is I didn't have a computer. So I was doing it with, without a computer, just in my head. Uh, and when we got our first computer at the school, then um, I was one of the ones who, who could program. So, yeah. So that was, mm-hmm. yeah. That, that rem- reminds me, oh, it brings me back flashbacks uh, of me writing AppleSoft Basic oh, yeah. without a computer, <laughs> yeah, just on paper, and then just kind of uh, uh, waiting or uh, very 
anxiously, I should say, to go back home so I can copy the program from a piece of paper into the computer. Yeah. Uh, now, how, <laughs> how things have changed. Yeah. No, I think I still do that in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got to fix this thing. Oh, oh yeah, that's probably how I'm going to do it. Uh, so my next question is, are there any books that you've given as a gift that are related to uh, teaching? Uh, well, um, the two sample books that go with the, the Innovate Shield, so they're, they're freely available. Mm-hmm. Right. So I, we wrote one um, larger book, which has got about um, 50 pages in it, uh, and then we did two, two of the sample books. So they were just there to help students, uh, so help students and teachers know how to use the Innovate Shield. And the other one is, is pretty cheap. I think we put a five, we had to put a, a little bit of money on it just to, you know, cover, cover things like, because um, it's not free to get a um, ISBN number, you have to pay for that. So sure. mm-hmm. I don't think yeah. we've, I don't think we've covered our costs yet either. <laughs> so we're still in, I still in the black. It sounds familiar. <laughs> Publishing business uh, is pretty hard. Yeah. Um, so how people can, how can people get in touch with you if you want them to get in touch? Because you know, <laughs> you might pay. Yeah, I'm happy with teachers to get in touch with me or, or anybody else. Um, I think I've, I sent you my email address. Um, I've got my educational email. I've got two email addresses. So one is the one I use for, um, you know, the, just for teachers and things, and I've got my other one. So if I send those to you, will you put them on as a link to the podcast? Yep, yeah? definitely. Right. I'll put yep. them in the show notes. Are you on social media? Are you got a blog? Um, yeah, I've, I've got a, a face. There's a Facebook page, which is um, I see tool, T-Tools for Teachers, and uh, the the YouTube channel, which is ICT Tools for Teachers too. I did have a website. It's probably still there, but I just haven't had any time to um to update it in quite a few years. It's just one of those things. You spread yourself too thin, and you end up doing not much at all. So yeah, yeah, no problem. No, that's, that's actually quite good, especially a YouTube channel. I think uh, we will include all that in our show notes. Are you on Twitter by any chance? I I am on Twitter, but I, I don't really used Twitter too much. It was, yeah, it's a weird thing. I don't, I just, I couldn't handle the, the shorter tweets and I, I think they've lengthened them now, haven't they? But yeah, I just started. Yeah, you can do a smaller say now. Yeah. <laughs> <on the Twitter. laughs> you too can follow Trump. Yeah, yeah especially Trump. Yeah. It's, it's fun. Uh, Trump. Yeah, so getting off the political. <laughs> what? Trump? We're going to do a tariff. Trump. Let's not go in. Sorry, Peter, I should not have said the word. <laughs> you said the word now that you said a whole thing. Oh, no. Okay, moving on. All right. Well, thank you very much, Seven. I really appreciate your time. And yes, uh, Thank you so much. I actually had another five questions to ask you, so we're going to have to do this again yeah, soon. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, it's been, <laughs> it's it's been fun. Questions. Yeah, and um, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, you can uh, Now you're going to run off to the... Field, to the field, track and field, field yeah. <laughs> and, and I think I said this too in an email, Peter, you were one of my uh, Arduino he- heroes, so it's um, good to um, <laughs> good to have Thank some you, time um, in a discussion with you today because, yeah, I've, I've always wanted to um, meet you and, and chat to you, so it's been fantastic. Thank you, really appreciate it. So I hope to uh, talk to you and even better to see you soon. Yeah, fantastic. My travel down to Melbourne. Yeah, yeah great. Okay, have a good day, Simon. All right, thank you very much. You, you have a good day too. So bye, uh, Peter and Marcus. been a pleasure. Bye-bye. That's all for this episode. The notes for this episode that include links to many of the resources mentioned and information on how to get in touch with Seven are available on our website, texplore.com forward slash p forward slash stemiverse. Each episode comes with its own page on the Tech Explorations website and a goldmine of information in the notes. This Stemiverse podcast episode was produced by Tech Explorations. Do you have any questions or suggestions? Would you like to nominate a friend or colleague to be our guest? Please email us at ta at texplore.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes by searching for the name of our podcast, Stemiverse. That's S-T-E-M-I-V-E-R-S-E. Thanks for listening and we'll see you again next time.